The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, good morning, good afternoon to everyone, and apologies for starting a couple of minutes late. It is a pleasure to have you all here today on behalf of the MBSAP Forum and the Goxie webinar series. I want to welcome you all to a webinar series on environmental governance of the mining sector. I am Eva Gurriam with the MBSAP Forum and the United Nations Development Program team. Thank you for attending today's session on meaningful stakeholder involvement in decision-making processes, including a case study from Kenya. Today, I will help facilitate this session together with my colleague, Daniel Perez from the MBSAP Forum team, who will support the question and answer session of this webinar and will be technical support. So this webinar provides a broad overview of meaningful stakeholder engagement and why it matters. We explore tools you can use to develop effective strategies to integrate stakeholder engagement into the environmental management of mining. And a case study from Kenya will be used as a starting point for discussions and sharing experiences. Now for today's webinar, we have a fantastic group of speakers. And I'd like to introduce the first speaker and the moderator of today's webinar, Mr. Mats Kulberg. Mats works for the Swedish Environmental Protection Agency as a communications advisor. He has more than 20 years of experience of working with communications, environmental management and capacity development for the private sector, municipalities and government agencies in Sweden, as well as internationally. Now, before I hand over the microphone to Mats, I'd like to address some of the logistics of today's webinar. We have up to two hours for this webinar. And after all the presentations have concluded, we will proceed with a question and answer session. Now to make your questions, you can do two things. Either you can write them on the chat box in the control panel on your screens, or you can ask the question using your microphone. To do this, you must click on the hand in the control panel on your screen. Daniel will then proceed to open your microphone so you can ask your questions. I encourage you to think of your questions as you hear the presentations. And you can write your questions or raise your hand even while the presenters speak. Now, unless Daniel opens your mics, all attendees, except for the speakers, will be in listening mode only. This will reduce interference and facilitate communication during the webinar. Also, uh, as many of our participants are not native English speakers, myself included, I would la like to remind all presenters of the importance of speaking slowly and clearly. Lastly, this session will be recorded and it will be available at the MBSAT Forum website. That is mbsatforum.net. And all the participants will receive an email with a link to watch it, as well as a PDF copy of the presentations. Now, without further ado, Mats, you have the microphone, and everybody enjoy the session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eva. And thank you for, for inviting us, and a big thank for your uh, for you participants out there for, for joining us as uh, Eva mentioned uh, in today's session uh, we are going to present an overview of the concept of participation and, and meaningful stakeholder engagement and why it matters in terms of added value uh, we will also briefly present some ideas on how to develop engagement strategies before a case study from, from Kitui County in Kenya uh, kind of puts our more theoretical presentations into real life context. We will, uh, we will also get some key insights based uh, on the presentations and the case study before we open the floor for questions and answers. So that's the, the setup of, of today's session. So what is meaningful stakeholder engagement? Well, Let's start with this slide. 
So based on our own experience from, from the environmental governance program, working with partners in Colombia, Mongolia, Mozambique, and Kenya, I have picked up a few terms uh, quite commonly used discussing the need to, to engage different stakeholders in different stages of the mining cycle. And my notion is that there are some shall we say, misconceptions. Uh, the terminology is, is indeed slippery, especially when it comes to distinctions and overlaps between, for example, terms such as information, consultation, engagement, and consent. But for me, participation is the keyword here, and, and whether the engagement of stakeholders becomes meaningful is partly related to how we think participation, how we actually implement it. However, apart from these, uh, shall we say, disparities between the definitions, I believe it's relatively safe to say, and we can discuss this, but uh, I think it's safe to say that stakeholder engagement, participation is becoming recognized uh, that if we are to get mining right, this is a, as much a, a social process as it is an engineering and technical project. So if we recognize this social aspect, it becomes critical to the viability of mining to allow the participation of stakeholders throughout the mining cycle, whatever we call it. So, so that's the key. So a continuous dialogue between, for example, governments, communities and companies is needed to achieve an agreed consensus on how to share the benefits as well as how to manage the risks of mining, including environmental risks. And participation and engagement also serves to build social capital and trust among diverse stakeholders. So there are many added values that goes beyond compliance, but let us get back to that. Okay, so already now uh, I can reveal that we have three key messages that we want you to, to carry with you or, or remember throughout the session. One, Participation is a core human right principle, and I will explain more about that later. Two, there can be no participation without communication. And three, failing to plan is planning to fail. So that is efforts to engage stakeholders and make participation meaningful. Efforts needs to be planned, such efforts. So basically, in order to fulfill our human rights obligations, we need to communicate. Communication is a tool to create participation and for making inclusive participation and joint decision making to happen, we need to apply techniques that are to be found in, in the toolbox of strategic communication planning, such as, for example, problem and stakeholder analysis. Okay, a quick background on, on participation. In Article 1, in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights from 1948, it is stated that all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They are endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in the spirit of brotherhood. Basically, the rights apply to each and every one of us without exceptions. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights, and all human beings have the right. To, to all human rights without discrimination of any kind. So participation inclusion is a core human right principle together with equality, non-discrimination, transparency and accountability. It is also a key principle of good governance and, and governance, uh, as you know, is basically about how states and governments handle its affairs at all levels. So the realization of human rights and good governance includes participation. And to zoom in uh, even more on participation, we have principle 10 of the Rio Declaration from 1992. And this principle 10 has become a globally recognized framework for the develop development of national standards and laws for access to information, public participation in decision-making and justice in environmental matters. And also in many states, these 
goals are also incorporated into to the constitution as constitutional protections of the right to a healthy environment and other rights such as right to life, health, adequate standards of living, rights of freedom, freedom of expression and association. We also have the ORUS Convention that puts the Rio Declaration into practice. And together, uh, this Principle 10 and the Convention offers protection both for the environment and for human rights. And this protection can actually help us respond to many challenges uh, facing our world. Uh, climate change, loss of biodiversity, air and water pollution, poverty eradication, peace and security. Uh, so there are many values here. Uh, so, so basically, uh, Principle 10 and ORS Convention provide a solid and comprehensive framework for governments to engage the public effectively uh, in uh, different matters. And as I mentioned, we also find uh, issues of participation in, in many different constitutions, and this is an example from 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 the Kenya, the Constitution of Kenya. In Article 69, for example, it stated that the state shall encourage public participation and every pe uh, person has a duty to cooperate. There are also paragraphs talking about Kenya in, in uh, the, the Environmental Management and Coordination Act and in various EIA guidelines, for example. We also have the SDGs from 2015 where there are many references to participation. And as you know, the SDGs are, are global, universal, and with a vision to leave no one behind and to seek to realize the human rights of all. So there is indeed a link here. And to, to achieve the, the, the goals and its overarching objective uh, to end poverty, uh, there is a need to, to involve stakeholders and, and to develop partnerships. If we look at mining more specifically, and the SDGs also references, and according to a quite recently published uh, UN document uh, mapping mining to the Sustainable Development Goals, some of the conclusions are that to realize the full potential for scaling up its positive and minimizing its negative impacts, more systematic and sustained dialogues and partnerships are needed. We also have numerous guidance notes, standards, etc., highlighting the importance. And I'm just showing a few examples here. However, and, and this is the thing now, uh, even though there are many normative frameworks in place, national regulatory and policy frameworks and ongoing initiatives initiated by the industry and other actors that guide stakeholder engagement processes, there are still gaps going from, from policy to practice. Again, in our program, for example, the EGP, we keep hearing that even though consultations with local communities regarding an uh, impact assessment, for example, before issuing a mining permit, even though they are perceived as important, these processes, they are sometimes only observed as, as a formality or a one-time set of public meetings. So even when efforts are made in compliance with the, the regulatory framework, the question remains, how can the process be more aligned to the real underlying purpose? And that is meaningful stakeholder engagement. Compliance is, is a foundation, of course, but when it comes to participation, could it be worthwhile or even necessary to go beyond compliance? So partly to answer that question, but by adopting a participatory approach and by engaging stakeholders broadly and throughout the mining cycle, there are opportunities to create value and to, to mitigate risks. A purely compliance-based approach will miss key strategic opportunities for any stakeholder. So meaningful stakeholder engagement, which describes a broad, inclusive and continuous process between a company, government, and those potentially impacted by mining activities, encompasses a range of activities and approaches and spans throughout the different stages of the mining cycle, from planning to post-closure, and it involves multiple stakeholders. 
But to close the gap again, to, from go, uh, going from policy to practice, there are, as I mentioned, many things to, to, to improve. And one of the many issues is to better understand the concept of participation. There are, for example, some key characteristics of participation that we need to understand, listed in the slide. For example, power relations, context, and what we actually mean when we say that stakeholders have participated. There are, for example, different degrees of participation and inclusion, and sometimes the purpose can be to manipulate or, or, to, or, or be of a more symbolic uh, uh, kind, rather than a true partnership with aim to delegate power and control. So giving clear and timely access to information is important, though, to, to enable stakeholders to voice their views and consultations where concerned stakeholders are invited to share experiences and insights to impact decision making. All this is, of course, important, but, but when part participation is uh, exercised so that decisions are delegated and control is handed over to the stakeholders themselves, we are getting closer to, to the true meaning of, of meaningful stakeholder engagement. So basically, all those with a legitimate interest in the outcome of a decision should be given equal possibilities to participate. So to conclude, meaningful stakeholder engagement should be based on participatory approaches that are two-way, conducted in good faith, should be responsive, and ongoing throughout the mining cycle. And this is the mining cycle that we refer to, by the way, uh, which we will talk uh, much more about later. But the idea is by, by dividing the process into different phase, phases, it makes it easier to identify key activities, such as land use planning, impact assessments, monitoring, remedy, remediation, etc. who to involve and how. Now, I will hand over the word to my colleague uh, Rose Kimoto, who will talk about the the, the, adieu, the added value. And Rose is a human rights lawyer from Kenya. She specializes around business and human rights and sustainable and inclusive business. Most recently, she has been working with the Institute for, for Human Rights and Business as the program manager for East Africa. And currently she works as a consultant for the Danish Institute for Human Rights. Uh, rights. Uh, she's also uh, an alumna of, of Georgetown University Law Center in Washington, D.C. So over to you, Rose. Right. Uh, thank you, Matt and uh, the organizers uh, for giving us uh, the opportunity to share our thoughts on this very important topic. I would also like to thank uh, all our attendees for making time to be part of this uh, webinar. Uh, now, I'm going to quickly present uh, uh, a sketch of uh, some benefits as well as uh, some risks uh, that might be there uh, with regard to stakeholder engagement. And uh, I'll look at it from uh, uh, the main um, um, the main uh, stakeholders, that is uh, from the perspective of government, uh, the communities that uh, may be impacted by projects, as well as uh, the companies or project proponents. Next slide, please. And uh, as um, as the slide uh, is titled, uh, essentially what uh, what I would like to put across is uh, why are we actually even focusing on uh, stakeholder engagement? And uh, it's quite um, a complex uh, issue, uh, mainly in uh, in implementation. And uh, as uh, was presented earlier by, by Matt, uh, even the, the, the terminology that is uh, sometimes used uh, makes it even more complex. However, it is something that is uh, important uh, to, to be done. And uh, it's something that needs to be done throughout uh, the project life cycle, 
and they're particularly uh, to be done quite early, as we shall see from the, the case study, why it's important to, to start early as well as to keep at it. And uh, one, it's because uh, you, one wants to understand uh, what the issues and concerns are, and these uh, evolve uh, over time. So, for example, when you're starting out exploring um, whatever the concerns of the community might be at that particular time would be, uh, will our land be, be taken? And uh, should then uh, you move towards uh, perhaps developing uh, the project? Then the issues now perhaps will evolve to uh, what the compensation will be like if people are going to be resettled and uh, those kinds of issues. So again, it really helps to understand what, what issues are at any particular time uh, during the, the project cycle. And then, of course, then uh, it will help uh, the, the company to ensure that uh, those issues uh, are properly integrated into the decision uh, making uh, process. And uh, that uh, in that process, then communities will feel that uh, their, their perspectives are taken into, into account and uh, uh, can, in the process, they build trust uh, with, the, with the company. Uh, as has already been mentioned, uh, it is becoming uh, a legal requirement uh, in quite a, across a number of jurisdictions. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it's also um, a, a requirement uh, from uh, from many from many lenders, uh, industry organisations, as well as uh, associations. And uh, as we will see in the Kitui uh, case study. Uh, it could also be um, a, a legal risk uh, area, and they will be able to, to see that. Um, also relates to the question of uh, indigenous uh, persons, and uh, here is where we do have uh, international standards that uh, really uh, speak to uh, the, the requirement to involve uh, indigenous uh, persons, and that's uh, the free uh, prior informed uh, consent uh, principles. Um, the other reason why it matters is, uh, again, it helps uh, in uh, to resolve uh, issues as, uh, as they arise. As I said, it builds confidence, and part of that building confidence is that uh, communities are able to to bring in uh, whatever issues uh, they are. And uh, if uh, unusually, uh, grievance uh, mechanisms are built into the process, then uh, the process in the process, then uh, issues uh, are resolved uh, as, uh, as they come. And uh, some years ago, there was a, a study that was done around um, what is really the actual cost uh, uh, for companies uh, when stakeholder engagement perhaps uh, fails and they result into shutdowns or, uh, or delays. And this is really a, a, financial, a financial cost. And so having an open door and an open policy to keep, um, to keep uh, processes open through which uh, difficult issues can be raised and dialogues uh, can be had, uh, can, uh, protect and, um, can protect against uh, such closures and uh, of course the financial risks that uh, come uh, with it. Next slide, please. And uh, as I said, uh, we'll be looking at um, the three different uh, stakeholders. And uh, from, uh, from experience, uh, there are benefits uh, to the different uh, stakeholders. And uh, we've already uh, spoken about some of them, which is essentially the improved, uh, the improved communication, the trust building, as well as in the process of uh, engaging uh, the companies gets to and even the community gets to learn about um, uh, critical information as well as the community perspectives and the perspectives are really important uh, and whereas they might not always be be the reality or you know the the um, or the, the factual issues, it's important to understand what those perspectives are uh, so that uh, they, can be, they can be addressed. It's also important for companies to provide information because again, uh, information voids uh, often get uh, filled with a lot of uh, untruths and rumors which can prove to be uh, quite uh, expensive uh, to, to companies uh, in the real run. Next slide, please. 
Uh, I think we already spoke about uh, the, the the cost of uh, of conflict, and uh, as uh, as uh, as I mentioned, uh, there are studies that uh, have been carried out as to how much this can be, and um, uh, as you can see from this slide, uh, it can cost as much as uh, 20 million uh, 20 US million dollars a week, uh, which is uh, quite uh, expensive uh, for for the company as well as uh, not to mention uh, the, the number of um, productive uh, man hours that are actually spent uh, trying to resolve a conflict uh, as opposed to perhaps uh, engaging uh, in other activities. So the, the cost can really uh, escalate. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of uh, communities, uh, for communities, it's, uh, stakeholder engagement is, first of all, uh, an important source of uh, information. Uh, communities uh, often uh, don't have uh, adequate information to help them to really be able to voice their concerns or even uh, participate uh, in decisions that really are important to them. So opportunities for for stakeholder engagement uh, usually provide uh, first-hand information for the community. The communities can query the kind of information as well as um, they can give their, their inputs which can be included in the, in the policy uh, uh, development. At the same time, uh, because it's, uh, I mean, ideally it should be uh, a two-way communication, it also gives uh, the company an opportunity to learn uh, about uh, not just what it says it does, but uh, essentially what it does in practice, because the community is able to bring back uh, information and then the, the company can be able to gauge itself uh, as to how well it's doing against perhaps uh, policy commitments that uh, exist on, uh, on certain things. Um, the other issue is also about uh, identification of the areas of uh, mutual interest, and this is important because uh, Increasingly, there are requirements around the community development agreements to be uh, developed together with communities. And again, uh, the process of uh, stakeholder engagement is one through which uh, these kinds of uh, agreements and uh, discussions in terms of uh, perhaps uh, what kinds of uh, social investments that uh, companies uh, can make and should make uh, would be beneficial to the community and not just that those which the company actually uh, feels uh, it wants to do uh, but it gives uh, that opportunity for the community to really be able to identify for itself what are those areas perhaps that uh, the company might um, might invest might invest in as, uh, as part of those arguments uh, next slide please And uh, of course, for, for, for the government, uh, the, the, the benefits are also there. Uh, first, it's important for, for, for governments to pass information uh, to communities uh, even before the arrival of, um, of investors or, or companies. And when governments do this, uh, you find that there's uh, enhanced trust. Usually, unfortunately, this doesn't happen uh, uh, quite uh, that way. Often uh, communities uh, would just be, you know, approached or they would find uh, investors in their community without really prior uh, information uh, from the government. Uh, so, but if you find uh, where governments uh, also share uh, these kinds of um, information with, uh, with communities, then there would be uh, enhanced uh, trust. The other issue is also uh, that government uh, will also learn about uh, what the concerns of the communities are and integrate them into, into, into policies, but also perhaps into, I would say, actions that uh, touch on uh, particular projects. For example, if a government is um, required as part of the contract to acquire land for, for, uh, for a company, then by listening to the community, then the government will be able to perhaps uh, come up with a better and a more acceptable and satisfactory ways of uh, compensation and, uh, and, uh, and, and resettlement. Uh, of course, at the same time, it also follows that uh, then if this is done well, that uh, perhaps uh, if there's an expansion 
uh, or future projects could they, they could be mining or not mining that uh, a government that has taken this uh, approach uh, to dialogue with citizens might have uh, a better and uh, easier time convincing uh, citizens to to back uh, to back the to back the project um, obviously for example like in the in the case of Kenya you have uh, the requirement in law for for public participation and that also binds uh, the, the state in the first instance and so uh, by and uh, by ensuring uh, public participation the the state in this case is also uh, is also honoring uh, its obligation uh, in law uh, likewise um, the the government uh, also has uh, of course uh, um, primary uh, obligations and responsibilities uh, towards uh, communities and uh, in addition to the project uh, being there it's important that governments also continue serving our communities and um, not just uh, perhaps waiting for companies to be the ones that uh, do a uh, community type investment program. So by governments uh, actually uh, engaging, governments are also able to then uh, play, their, play their role and really deliver, uh, for example, issues around the basic services and, uh, and other goods that they are, uh, the ones that are obliged to, to deliver to, to communities. Next slide, please. In so, this next. Uh, okay. okay. No, sorry, sorry, Rose, for interrupting. Okay, we we continue. Eh? Yes, we continue. You take the lead, please. Okay. No, no. I just wanted to thank you for 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 presenting on. on um, uh, added value and, and uh, opportunities uh, related to, to, to engaging stakeholders throughout the mining cycle. So I just wanted to, to touch base. So we have presented uh, the sort of the, the policy framework, uh, some of the obligations, and also uh, Rose presented the win-win the, the uh, opportunities. And now we, we're going to talk a little bit about or, or give some examples, some some key takeaways on on how to develop a, a stakeholder engagement strategy. So I hand over the word to you, uh, Rose, again. Oh, okay, then, uh, Matt, uh, if you could kindly. Um... All right. Um, as uh... Uh, as we think uh, in terms of the of, of the strategies, I, I think um, what is uh, most important, like uh, any any communication um, uh, need that uh, or requirement that uh, that we have, it's important to sketch uh, what is it that you really want to, what do you want to achieve uh, by um, your stakeholder uh, engagement. Uh, do you want to get uh, the buy-in of the people? Do you want to maybe just uh, pass information? Do you want to conclude uh, the community development agreement? What is it that uh, that uh, that that one wants? Because uh, again, uh, that also um, uh, it also leads you to think about uh, how one uh, how one goes about it. And of course, in so thinking, uh, it's important uh, for the company to keep uh, at the back of the mind uh, what benefits that uh, that they stand to to take away from that, because uh, certainly one cannot uh, expect uh, cooperation uh, from uh, people if uh, you don't engage and uh, and uh, and cooperate uh, with them. So thinking of the the benefits of the one of uh, not just the the company, of course, uh, but also the um, the community. You need to be able to sketch out uh, clearly how do the community uh, stand to benefit from uh, from something like this. And uh, it could be one, uh, the information having uh, channels of uh, of communication, uh, ensuring that uh, grievances uh, have been have been have been resolved. And uh, also, ultimately, it's uh, also important to think about uh, other uh, stakeholders or other partners. And uh, again, uh, what is it that uh, they, 
they could get away from that. And in so doing, you would still need to to catch uh, who are your who are your partners. Um, and these include uh, governments. They could include uh, your your lenders. And so there should be something in need for for everyone. And um, once we once that that is done, uh, then um, I think one can be able to come up with a with a good uh, strategy of how to ensure that uh, everybody wins. And um, what, what uh, we've also found uh, in our uh, in our discussions, uh, I'll say with the with different stakeholder groups, is um, the importance of uh, ground rules. And uh, it, it really is important to to be able one to 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 establish who is it that is going to be speaking uh, and to who. And it's again, it's important because uh, not everybody can be part of the can be part of the of, of the discussions. And uh, particularly for for communities, uh, it's good to really think about them. Uh, so that to ensure that uh, one, we have identified who the bona fide uh, stakeholders are, uh, because uh, leaving them out uh, could, uh, in some cases, uh, even um, illegitimize uh, the whole process. Uh, but at the same time, we also want to think about uh, who their the legitimate uh, representatives uh, are. Uh, again. Um, these ideally should be, uh, in case of communities, um, representatives that uh, are selected by the communities uh, themselves uh, based on uh, uh, what it is that uh, the community uh, would like to, to see and people who they feel really uh, are likely to uh, represent uh, what their perspective uh, might be. Um, Again, uh, it is also important to to have uh, uh, perhaps uh, a plan of uh, how it will be. And um, usually uh, one could plan, for example, like to have um, regular meetings uh, at maybe monthly intervals or whatever other intervals depending on uh, the level at which the project is at because you might find that um, at different levels, uh, the communication needs uh, are different, but uh, it should also be important to have this uh, clarified uh, so that uh, people can know uh, perhaps you know when when meetings are there and uh, and, and make themselves uh, available to be able to to attend uh, and to and to participate. Um, it's also important that. Um, as we as we think about uh, coming up with uh, with uh, with some principles to to guide uh, stakeholder engagement, to also think about uh, if uh, it's uh, a company that uh, maybe has uh, other projects elsewhere, uh, it could take stock of uh, what experience has been uh, in other in other stakeholder engagement efforts, what lessons can be taken from there. And uh, perhaps, uh, of course, to be contextualized. And um, if, for example, it is maybe uh, a company that maybe has bought into uh, an existing or ongoing project, it's also important to consider uh, what uh, uh, the previous uh, owners uh, have been doing. And uh, if and uh, perhaps whatever legacy issues might arise uh, from that, if it's a completely new project, uh, again, it's good to think about uh, what is the experience of the community in uh, stakeholder uh, engagement. And uh, this uh, is really important because then one would uh, would know or would at least uh, have an idea of um, how to engage uh, a community. So, for example. If it's a community that has not uh, had a lot of uh, experience with uh, stakeholder engagement, one may find uh, that uh, uh, perhaps there isn't uh, much feedback from uh, the community using a formal channel. 
and would then have to look for other ways as uh, to get that feedback as trust is built uh, over time. So really to to reflect, uh, but then also as uh, as um, um, the previous presenter said, since it's not uh, a one-time um, event, but uh, uh, one that is uh, that continues throughout the mind cycle, it's uh, it's also important to have um, to have spaces or um, time within the process where uh, a company uh, reflects. And if a stakeholder engagement plan, uh, for example, and the mechanism already exists, it would be important to also uh, engage that mechanism to reflect how well it's working and perhaps uh, what are the things that uh, could be improved uh, or changed or uh, enhanced. Next slide. And um, uh, in the in, in the stakeholder uh, uh, engagement uh, process uh, itself, um, there are some there, there are some uh, principles that uh, essentially uh, one can uh, can keep uh, can keep in mind. Uh, and um, and the, the what is presented here in this slide are uh, is um, a set of uh, principles that uh, um, was uh, discussed and agreed with uh, stakeholders as part of uh, an initiative that uh, I was uh, I was part of and uh, Matt uh, referred to, which is the the, the Nairobi uh, process, and. Um, and uh, under that process, um, we had some discussions, uh, including the community representatives, including uh, civil society, uh, companies, as well as uh, governments to discuss uh, the whole issue of uh, stakeholder engagement in uh, the extractive uh, sector. And uh, after our discussions, uh, we came up with, the, uh, we asked uh, um, the stakeholders to give us uh, some what they thought were key principles uh, in the process and this is what uh, and this is part of what uh, uh, we got and uh, based on uh, what the feedback we got we then uh, collated uh, that feedback and synthesized it into some of these uh, principles and um, issued a, a discussion uh, paper. So to just go through some few of them. So uh, if it's a principle around inclusivity, this really is about uh, working with all stakeholders and uh, not just those that perhaps that uh, uh, agree, uh, but um, find that uh, it's important to perhaps uh, hear out those that uh, perhaps uh, mainly disagree with you so that you can also get uh, uh, the, their perspectives. I think we've already spoken about uh, starting uh, early. And again, this is to ensure that uh, really the information uh, flow uh, and the, the information about the project uh, is as uh, factual and accurate uh, as possible uh, right uh, from the start. Um, and it was alluded to earlier, it's not a one-off engagement, but really throughout uh, the lifetime of the minds of, uh, of, uh, of a project. So, if you imagine the lifespan of a mind, some over 30 years, so it's really about uh, engaging uh, for for the long term. Um, again, uh, one should uh, also uh, uh, ensure that uh, that it is uh, adaptable as uh, as much as possible, and this is to uh, ensure that uh, it's really uh, there's flexibility that is uh, that is uh, included uh, into it, and flexibility can work perhaps around um, the mediums of uh, of communication. Uh, if one finds that uh, it's a community that uh, perhaps uh, where literacy levels are low or where people perhaps you have a, a, a grievance mechanism that requires people to to write down their, their grievances directly and maybe people are not um, are quite comfortable with that so to come up with the, to be able to be flexible uh, enough uh, to ensure that uh, um, those uh, specific uh, contextual issues are built into 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 the process 
there should be transparency into into the into the process and uh, and here is uh, it's also important that uh, uh, as part of this is a documentation that is uh, that is there uh, information uh, flow uh, flows should be should be well known and uh, well established and uh, that uh, uh, people that need to get onto the system or to communicate uh, back are, are able uh, to do so uh, in a manner that is uh, quite uh, known and, uh, and understandable. Um, of, another thing is that uh, it should also be culturally uh, appropriate. And uh, again, this is really to ensure that, uh, that uh, we are really uh, not just uh, cutting and, uh, and, uh, and pasting, but uh, we are able to ensure that uh, we are um, uh, that we are respecting uh, the the culture, but also the the ways in which uh, people talk to each other in different uh, in in different uh, communities. Next slide, please. Matt, I think you uh, take over from here. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Rose, for that very interesting presentation. And I will be uh, very brief now because I know it's a, it's a, it's a lot to take in. But uh, just to continue on the same note as 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 uh, Rose was talking about, uh, trying to to further put it uh, all these uh, principles into a context. I will just talk briefly about uh, strategic uh, communication planning. So basically uh, starting uh, an engagement process, it, it's very important to, to, to do, as Rose also said, to, to, to carry out some kind of assessment and look into what kind of problem you are facing what the purpose of the engagement strategy would be, look at stakeholders involved, different needs and perceptions, challenges, barriers, risks, and also possible solutions. Uh, so, so, so basically, we encourage you to, to put a lot of effort into doing this kind of, a, of, a, of an assessment that then later can, can inform or translate into a, a strategy with, with the clear objectives, with the target groups, so that is you don't have to address all the stakeholders that you have identified in the assessment. You, you, can, you can actually target out some, some, some specific target groups and also look at the, the levels of change that you want to, to achieve. It's not always the same. Look at different uh, channels, arenas, uh, for us, messages, and 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 also have indicators that are, that are based on the assessment. And then and you recognize this from from any project planning actually. But but then you can develop a work plan with activities, start implementing, and also monitor and evaluate. And again, relating to to, to mining. Uh, and again, relating to, to our EGP program, it has been very helpful to, to look at, at different phases of the mining cycle and trying to identify key activities during each phase, just to be, be, become more specific. It's not just an impact assessment, as we talked about before, uh, during the, the pre-feasibility and feasibility phase. It's also about land use planning, as I said. It's about, um, uh, it could be re remediation, it can be monitoring, etc. So, So depending on the kind of activity uh, under a specific phase, it's also easier to, to identify stakeholders related to that key activity. And you can, can start uh, assessing uh, different specific needs depending on the context, and also develop methods on how to engage. It's not always the same. Uh, as I said before, it's dependent on the, on the context. So stakeholder engagement, 
throughout the, the, the mining cycle. Planning, exploration, feasibility, construction, operation, expansion, closure and post-closure. Uh, different stakeholders, different needs, different ways to, to engage. And just to, 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 to show you, and I, I couldn't fit all of them, but, but there are a lot of stakeholders involved in different phases. But, but just to, to have a net list here, we have local communities, we have government, local government, private sector, academia, donors, government agencies, NGOs, CBOs, media, it can be church-based, uh, faith-based uh, organizations, etc., etc. So there are a lot of stakeholders and usually they have specific needs. So this is just to show you uh, one way of finding out the level of knowledge, uh, will, and if they have the mandate, for example, because sometimes we are applying a method or, 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 or uh, an approach based on an assumption. We assume maybe that that, that uh, a stakeholder group or a target group needs to, to have more knowledge, but actually the, uh, the problem might be that uh, that there is no will or there is no mandate. So so so, and if you have the knowledge and you have the will, and if if you don't have the mandate, that's an that's another another issue. So it's important to to find out what kind of problem there is and, and what kind of of uh, issue to address. So this is just one example uh, of what you can do during an assessment. And before we talk about the case study, uh, again, and also repeating what, what Rose said, it, it's important not to equate information with communication. Two-way communication is an approach or a participatory approach that is needed if you want to, to, to create understanding, acceptance, behavior, or, or even build a relationship. So if you want to go from I hear you, I understand you, to I trust you, I get you, you need to, to engage in participatory approaches. And information or data is of course useful to, 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 to build these relationships. Uh, but it's not the same, just to disseminate information, uh, you, you, you can't ex accept, uh, expect that, that you have acceptance or that you will create a behavior or, or build a relationship. So do not equate information with communication. And also, if we look at the complexity of an issue, and if we are not sure about what, it, uh, what we want to, to achieve, uh, this calls for, for, for participatory approaches. So high complexity, and if we're not sure of what we want to achieve, then we need to, to, to have approaches such as joint management, joint innovation. We need to build social capital capital, and, and, and engage maybe in, in pilot projects. So, so uh, engage stakeholders to inform uh, decisions throughout the mining cycle. So finally, uh, communication is a tool to create participation to achieve objectives and to contribute to dialogue and, and, and good quality. Now, um, I was just told that that uh, Bernard Mogesa, uh, who, who should present the, the case, is unfortunately not available. Uh, but I can mention that, that Bernard works for the Kenya National Commission on, on Human Rights. And he also has a long, long experience in the promotion and protection of human rights and particularly the, the application of human rights-based approaches. So uh, unfortunately he couldn't attend, but I will hand over the, the microphone again to, to Rose who kindly accepted to, to, to present the case. So over to you again, Rose. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Matt. Um, as uh, Matt said, I will present uh, the case on behalf of uh, Bernard uh, Mugesa. 
And uh, I think uh, the most uh, important uh, or one of the important things uh, to take away from this case is uh, really how um, uh, inadequate or uh, even perceptions of uh, inadequate uh, stakeholder engagement can actually be uh, a, legal, uh, a legal risk. Uh, and to just give a uh, background uh, to to this, um, Kitui is uh, one of the 47 counties. It's a, a rural uh, county uh, in the east of the of the country. Uh, the demographics of it uh, have been given uh, have been given there. Uh, and uh, need, I mean, uh, and what essentially um, it wants to highlight is that. Uh, uh, it's certainly an area where uh, there's uh, low uh, development and uh, uh, high uh, poverty uh, rates. Um, next slide, please. And uh, maybe to just uh, focus on, um, on on really uh, the issue at hand is that um, uh, there had there was uh, exploration of uh, for coal in uh, in part of Kitui, which is called uh, the Mui Basin, and um, the coal exploration uh, commenced in uh, 1999, and uh, some 73 uh, drilling, uh, 73 uh, exploration wells uh, were were dug, and uh, as a result of this. Um, the Ministry of uh, the Ministry of uh, Energy uh, uh, established that uh, there were viable uh, coal uh, deposits of about uh, 400 million uh, metric uh, tons. Um, what then happened was that um, uh, the ministry then uh, started uh, the the process of. Uh, uh, getting into a concession uh, agreement uh, for the for the blocks for essentially for uh, additional exploration and the eventual uh, exploitation uh, and development of the of the coal um, of the coal uh, find and um, the a tender was uh, was awarded to 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 a company and uh, then uh, some additional uh, work uh, started uh, to be done uh, in, uh, in, in Kitui. And uh, in part of that work were some, uh, some stakeholder engagement uh, work was also, was also done. And uh, there was a mobilization of, uh, of, uh, of the public to, to, to participate. And, um, what uh, part of that uh, process uh, involved uh, the the creation of uh, what was called um, some some local uh, some co some local committees, and uh, these local committees were committees that were um, uh, comprised of uh, persons from the from the local community and uh, were selected by the, the, the local community. And uh, actually the, 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 the Ministry of Energy was uh, involved and uh, facilitated the, the creation of this uh, liaison, uh, the liaison committee. And um, uh, what then uh, happened was that uh, despite um, uh, these attempts at uh, public uh, participation, was that uh, some members of the community uh, felt that uh, um, the consultation uh, or stakeholder engagement process was not um, uh, had not been properly uh, carried out, and that uh, they felt that uh, also the the award of the of the of the concessions or the tender that was also carried out without uh, public uh, participation. And uh, they also uh, alleged that uh, there were breaches of uh, right to information, uh, and uh, they were therefore concerned that uh, if uh, this development went on, there would be their right to uh, property would be threatened, as well as the right to a clean and healthy environment. Given that uh, they felt that they hadn't uh, quite participated even in the 
environmental uh, impact assessment uh, uh, process. There was also another issue which relates to benefit uh, sharing. And again, uh, the, the, the people that brought the case or the petitioners felt that, uh, again, this uh, process had been concluded uh, without, um, without them being uh, properly uh, involved. Um, the basis on which uh, this matter uh, came before court was is uh, Article 10 of the Kenyan Constitution and uh, uh, specifically um, sub Article 2, which uh, provides that um, the it provides Article 10 generally provides for national values uh, that should be um, observed in the implementation of the of the Constitution, but also essentially that should guide uh, our public uh, governance uh, in the country. And um, uh, sub-Article 2 uh, uh, includes among national values uh, and principles of governance, the provision for uh, participation of the people. So it requires that uh, people are, uh, are involved uh, in, uh, in, such, uh, in such affairs. And so the petitioners uh, invited the court to look into whether uh, in this process uh, that had been um, overseen by the Ministry of Energy, whether uh, there was really public participation that, uh, that, uh, that, had, taken, uh, that had taken place. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, it's uh, as I mentioned before that uh, the the there had been a liaison committees that uh, that were put in place uh, for for the project, and uh, these liaison and that these liaison committees were comprised of uh, people from the local uh, community, including uh, professionals uh, drawn from uh, different uh, backgrounds and had been selected by the, the, the people themselves, in addition to involving uh, people who essentially lived uh, uh, off the land uh, in, in Mui. Next slide. And um, so um, what, as I said, the court was uh, invited to, to, to look into, the, into that process and uh, to really determine whether uh, public participation uh, had actually uh, taken, uh, taken place. And uh, what the court then um, did, the court essentially uh, looked to whether the, the, the method uh, that uh, was, uh, was followed and the degree of uh, participation, whether it was uh, reasonable. And, uh, what the court then uh, said was that um, um, bearing in mind that uh, uh, public participation in uh, environmental governance matters is uh, also uh, an, in the constitution as uh, we saw earlier in uh, article um, 69, which uh, essentially also um, uh, has uh, corresponding uh, responsibilities for um, citizens themselves and individuals to be part of the, of the process. Uh, the court uh, stated that uh, at, uh, at a minimum, uh, some of the following uh, principles uh, ought to really uh, be, be ob observed by um, a government agency that is uh, trying to uh, promote uh, um, public participation in, uh, in environmental governance. One, that uh, there should be a program a uh, crafted uh, program, essentially uh, a written down program of uh, public uh, participation. And, um, and essentially in doing so, um, it needs to be both uh, quantitative and uh, qualitative, so to ensure that uh, there are enough uh, forums that, uh, that uh, or they at least uh, the forums are adequate and uh, the court said that uh, it will determine this depending on the nature of the, of the subject matter. So for something like this that was going to impact uh, quite a number of, uh, of people because of the expansiveness of the project, 
then the court would uh, expect that uh, certainly there be a number of fora that uh, allows for public to, to participate. Um, the court also said that uh, they, they would look uh, to ensure that uh, the process itself is uh, participatory and that uh, there has to be and uh, the program would have to show uh, inclusivity and uh, diversity and that uh, if uh, there were attempts, uh, intentional uh, attempts to lock out uh, bona fide stakeholders then uh, that program would be ineffective and uh, and uh, and illegal. And uh, again, to how how does one then determine um, uh, that uh, the the process is a uh, is a uh, is inclusive one? Uh, one would have to ensure that the participation of the the most uh, affected uh, people and uh, ensure that uh, their views are more deliberately uh, listened to and, uh, and, uh, and taken into account. But at the same time, uh, recognizing that um, the, the right to participation and the right to be heard uh, does not mean that uh, each individual ha uh, holds uh, uh, a veto. Um, and that uh, it is uh, what is important is that uh, uh, people are people are heard, and that uh, in the final uh, decision that uh, the the public uh, agency body is able to show uh, how those views uh, have been taken into account or how they have been uh, how they have been uh, considered. So really, the um, process should be one of uh, of good faith and um, and uh, again it should not um, also erode the idea of uh, cross fertilization or sharing of, uh, of, of different views uh, to enable uh, a decision to be to be reached so in the in the end um, the, the court considered uh, some of the things that uh, the ministry uh, had done and the ministry was able to show how it had communicated through uh, the established uh, administrative uh, channels all the way to the village level. Uh, the ministry had also engaged uh, additional temporary staff from the local community, essentially to serve as a communication link between the ministry and the local community. And uh, of course, there was the facilitation of the formation of the of the liaison uh, committees. These committees were gazetted; they met uh, regularly, and uh, essentially they kept the ministry uh, uh, abreast of, uh, of of discussions. Um, there had also been some uh, some site visits to similar uh, projects by some of the liaison committee uh, members, and. Uh, Essentially, the, the, the ministry uh, was working in a, co a collaborative manner with these uh, uh, liaison committees, but as well as uh, with other um, elected uh, uh, public uh, figures uh, from, uh, from, from the area. And uh, the, the court essentially in this case uh, actually came to the conclusion that uh, there, there had been uh, quite um, a lengthy and uh, qualitative uh, engagement and that uh, different mechanisms had been applied to reach as many people as, uh, as possible. In this case, that uh, the, the, that stakeholder engagement uh, uh, in accordance with uh, uh, Article 2 of uh, ensuring uh, participation of the people in uh, matters that affect them, that uh, it had actually been, uh, been effective. Next slide. And uh, with regard to the, to the benefit uh, sharing uh, agreement, um, Whereas at the beginning of interrupt Rose and Matt, it, just to remind you of the time, it's 10.15. And um, so we have enough time for Kate's presentation and uh, 
Q&A session. Okay, I think uh, with regard to the um, to to this uh, Kitui matter, I think um, I can wrap it up there. And uh, the the idea of this case study was, uh, as I said at the beginning, was to just uh, show how uh, stakeholder engagement uh, or can actually be a, a legal risk, and uh, that uh, communities can actually also be able to to use uh, judicial mechanisms to uh, protect and uh, ensure uh, the respect uh, of these uh, particular rights. Uh, I will end there and uh, I invite questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Rose, for this presentation and for filling in for, for Mr. Mogesa. Um, and I ho hopefully um, uh, this case will, will inspire our participants to, 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 to discuss. I find the issue, for example, very interesting that, and it's complicated, it shows the complexity that um, the court uh, found the, the process uh, adequate and still the community is not uh, satisfied. That's also interesting, I think. Now, you will hear a new voice. Uh, I will invite uh, Kate Kupitsche, Kupitsche, um who is an independent mediator and uh, dialogue facilitator specializing in private and public sector collaborative engagement. Kate focuses on uh, environmental and social safeguards, company community dialogue and consensus-based approaches to natural resource challenges. And, and she will uh, provide us with some insights and comments on the presentations. Kate, over to you. Thank you so much. Can you all hear me okay? Um, I uh, really appreciate being invited, so thank you so much um, for this. And I, I think that there are some very interesting insights and points made in this presentation about the importance of stakeholder engagement and really some of the most current thinking and good practice in this area. So I really appreciate that and appreciate opportunities like this for people to, to share this. Um, as all of you probably know, since you decided to attend this webinar, um, this is an area that's growing in importance and an impact. And as more and more communities experience the impacts of, of big extractive projects, um, and as companies move into more and more areas that are fragile or risky from a social and environmental perspective, this um, topic of engagement just becomes ever more critical. So um, thank you, Goxi, for doing this and, and for um, organizing this webinar. Um, I, I really like sort of just back to the very beginning, the three overarching messages as a, as a starting point. Um, it's fundamental to any stakeholder engagement program, anywhere of any size or scope. Um, participation is a core right or principle. Um, communication is key. You can't participate without excellent communication. And I love the failing to plan is um, planning to fail. Um, I think those are excellent constructs. Um, I would also add that participation and stakeholder engagement is a requirement of most extractive projects, um, particularly those who partner with or receive funding from large multilateral organizations and governments. Um, it was mentioned Article 69 in the Constitution of Kenya, encouraging public participation. Um, today, most governments have statutes that range from encouragement, as in the case of Kenya, um, to stricter laws regarding public engagement. Um, and these really range from national governments all the way to municipalities and departments that interface regularly with the public. So for example, local zoning departments, environmental agencies, or other public offices that have oversight of extractive projects or, or other types of projects with, with significant social and environmental footprints, I would say. Um, so beyond the things like the Rio Declaration and our host that were mentioned, um, there's scores of other treaties and conventions that require the signatories of those conventions to engage in stakeholder um, engagement or community participation. Um, we 
talk about the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, the UN Global Compact, Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, um, the EITI, the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, and many others that that all mention the, the right and the obligation of engaging stakeholders. Um, but beyond those international conventions and sort of the vo those voluntary principles, there are standards and safeguard policies of the multilateral organizations, um, big bilateral lending banks, organizations, um, and government regulations, all that require some form of stakeholder engagements for the projects that they support. Um, so the probably most well-known and frequently cited are the performance standards of the International Finance Corporation, um, the private sector lending arm of the World Bank Group. And so clients of the IFC, so people who um, borrow money from the IFC for private sector projects, and this includes a lot of mining extractive companies, are required to comply with those standards as a condition of their loans. Um, and with regard to stakeholder engagement, for example, performance standard one um, establishes the importance of integrate an integrated assessment um, to identify the environmental and social impacts and risks and opportunities of projects and to um, effective community engagement. So to engage people, um, and they say effectively, through disclosure of project-related information and consultation with local communities on the, the matters that directly affect them. Um, they require their client, so the, this is the IFC now requiring, uh, for example, Newmont Mining Company, if they're developing a project and borrowed money, um, to develop and implement a, a stakeholder engagement plan that's scaled to the um, project risks and impacts um, and tailored to the characteristics and interests of an affected community. So these are these are just requirements. And many, many other institutions now have similar safeguards, um, safeguard policies and standards. Um, and, and all of those require stakeholder engagement of some kind or another. So um, also the United Nations Development Program now has um, social and environmental standards. They've adopted uh, two years ago. And one of the key objectives of those standards of the UNDP is to ensure full and effective stakeholder engagement. Um, so there's a lot of work being done now um, to educate um, and inform UN staff and partners, implementing partners about these standards and to raise awareness about what that means and about how to engage communities and partners around those standards. And then specifically in those standards, is this requirement to engage communities. Um, the OECD was mentioned. Um, the OECD has guidelines now for multinational enterprises. That requires, those require companies to engage in adequate and timely communication in consultation with communities directly affected. Um, and then many bilateral banks, Credit Suisse, Royal Bank of Scotland, Commerce Bank, all of those have standards that also require engagement. And then other organizations now, a lot of the climate organizations, Forest Carbon Partnership Facility, the Green Climate Fund, the Adaptation Fund, and, and many others. So these are just standards that are more and more coming online and um, with clients and partners required to have engagement plans. Um, Rose mentioned um, free prior and informed consent which is a requirement that is included in most of these standards, um, central to the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People and ILO 169. But this is a requirement that's um, included in most of the standards, and it specifically requires engagement for the explicit purpose of obtaining the permission of Indigenous peoples around big projects. Um, so a whole big conversation in the standards, but um, I just raised that so that, you know, these are things that companies have to do in, in most cases. Um, so, but the standards alone are not enough. And without mechanisms for holding those organizations and entities accountable to the standards, standards really have little meaning or impact. Um, and so my principal area of work involves this aspect of the standards 
um, what we often refer to as the third pillar of the RUGI principles, the principles on business and human rights, which is access to remedy when things go wrong on projects. Um, and these mechanisms for holding um, organizations accountable to the standards are mechanisms that offer an opportunity for communities to raise grievances about projects when they believe that these standards are not being followed or when they believe that there's harm being done. Um, all of the multilateral banks and bilateral banks and, and development organizations that have these standards now have mechanisms in place. Um, they're usually both a compliance and a mediated or, or problem-solving approaches to, to managing the grievances. But um, so where, are, where there are these standards, there are mechanisms that, that are holding them accountable. Um, and today that's just standard practice. Um, so my first experience was um, for about five years with the Compliance Advisor Ombudsman of the um, IFC that holds the um, IFC accountable to um, their clients, holds them accountable to, these, to their standards. And now I'm working more closely with the UNDP um, social and environmental standards, but specifically with this uh, mechanism called the Stakeholder Response Mechanism, which is connected to the social and environmental standards of UNDP. And remember, these are now, these are opportunities for communities to raise grievances or concerns about a project when, um, as they relate to the standards. So in my experience working in these mechanisms, and responding to grievances in projects all around the world and, and in a lot of extractive industry projects, mining, oil, gas, a huge number of the complaints stem from communities not being or not believing that they've been engaged adequately or meaningfully. So um, Matt's talked about gaps in stakeholder engagement um, at one stage and that many project developers are treating stakeholder engagement requirements kind of as a one-time exercise or a consultation um, where they come in with a PowerPoint or a big presentation and they say, here's what we're going to do. And then they check off the list that they've conducted their stakeholder engagement. Um, so I often see this gap that Matt's referred to firsthand. Um, and that's where, what makes communities so enraged and um, where engagement and dialogue have not been taken seriously by project developers or by governments, they've not been meaningful. Um, and so that the meaningful part also alluded to throughout the presentations um, is just so critical. And um, I just think can't be um, stated strongly enough that what meaningful really means. And it, as, as all of these standards um, exist, there's really nothing that defines or guides very well what meaningful engagement really means. So I think there are some great points made in the presentations about um, the importance of two-way participatory approaches, good faith, um, ongoing engagement, deep engagement throughout a life cycle. And it's not just a one-off event. Um, and it was the issue of who you involve and how you involve them is key. Um, so this really begins with careful and thorough assessments of the nature of a project. Um, I know Mads and Rose both emphasized this, um, that the stakeholders and their views need to be vetted really early on. Um, you cannot implement a meaningful engagement plan without knowing a lot about an area and a population and a project's goals and lifestyles. Um, you need to know the history of the region, social relationships, past environmental issues, cultural context of the area. How do people engage with one another? How do they make decisions? How do they resolve problems? Um, so these are the kinds of things that very early on need to be um, understood before you can even begin a, a stakeholder engagement plan or developing a plan. Um, the Mats and Rose both mentioned and reiterated the importance of the project life cycle and engaging early. Um, and I, I loved Rose's principles, the slide you put up, Rose, about um, inclusivity, early start, engaging for the long term, transparency, accountability. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, the 
importance of developing a clear stakeholder strategy and understanding what you want to achieve before you put, uh, put it out there is so important um, and just critical to begin those conversations, conversations as early as possible. Not after an impact assessment, not when a crisis starts to arise or when people start to complain, but, but early on um, in a life cycle with the planning and exploration of the project as was pointed out in that slide of Matt's. Um, and I think the, this was made clear in the presentation about the coal mining project in Kitui County in Kenya. Um, people didn't believe that the consultation was carried out properly. They did not feel heard. They didn't feel informed. They felt threatened. They felt cheated out of benefits and involvement um, that they felt they had a right to under national law and international convention. Um, and I think that this case from Kenya is unfortunately too common that many companies pay a lot of lip service to the stakeholder engagement that they carry out. And many governments have engagement regulations and laws, but nonetheless fail to really carry them out or enforce them. Or as in the case of the coal mine in Kenya, the, the degree to which companies or governments adhere to those engagement requirements end up being challenged in the courts. Um, and also, as the Kenya case showed, people are seldom happy with the outcome of court challenges. Um, there's a long conversation in another webinar we could probably have about weak rule of law uh, and corruption, um, but essentially communities and project developers do much better by getting engagement right the first time, um, engaging authentically and in accordance with the laws and intents of the laws and the international norms and standards on engagement. Um, so stakeholder identification and issue identification are just critically important to a, a stakeholder engagement plan and to implementing that plan throughout a life cycle. Um, colleague that I know Sarah knows, some of you all know um, Luke Zanvliet, who's done a lot of work with extractive companies all over the world and written a very good book, um, has said that in the many places around the world where he's worked, He's only seen a handful of sites where managers really know how to relate with surrounding communities and how to engage them authentically. Um, he's a Canadian and he, he'd said that despite thousands of Canadian companies and in tens of thousands of sites, it's still really difficult to list even a dozen good companies who have really done it well. And he calls that tragic and I agree with him. I think things are changing. Um, Matt showed a slide of um, and mentioned a number of guidance materials, how-to materials on good stakeholder engagement um, resources. And in the past 10 years, as I've been deeply involved in this work, the number of publications and guidance notes and toolkits and reference materials is, is just grown exponentially. Um, and as the number of organizations that adopt stakeholder engagement requirements grow, I think so does the reading list about how to do it well. And um, so there's a lot of good material out there. A couple of years ago, I, I started keeping a bibliography and I, I add to it all the time because um, there's just so much coming online, um, but published by industry, by governments, by civil society, by the banks and the international development organizations. So I would just encourage participants to find some of those and keep them in your virtual libraries and actually read some of them because there's just some quite good material out there um, that sort of, I think, would do a deeper dive into the, um, the excellent comments and presentations here. Um, so I'll stop there so we can get to Q&A and um, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Kate, for those insightful insights and, and, and comments. And uh, as I said, uh, commenting, commenting on, 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 on Rose's presentation as well, hopefully this will, will um, fuel, some, fuel some comments and, and uh, so we have a good uh, Q&A. So now I will hand over to, to Daniel for the Q&A uh, question session. Thank you, thank you Mats. Thank you very much our experts, uh, Rose, Kate and Mats for your very interesting presentations. Thank you Mats for facilitating the session. Now it's 
time for our participants to ask their questions or share their thoughts. As Eva said at the beginning of the session, you can either post your questions in the question box or uh, raise your hand using the raised hand tool in the, in the control panel. And I will open your, your microphones so you can ask your questions. We have our first question from Santiago Ramos. Santiago asks, uh, is it possible to get direct benefits from the community included in the project execution, like, like schools, hospitals, and other services to improve community life quality? I think this uh, question is for Rose uh, or any other um, of our experts. I'm going to read the question again. Is it possible to get direct benefits for the community included in the project execution, like schools, hospitals, and other services to improve community life quality? And this is really open for any of the presenters who would like to, to respond. Well, I, this is Kate, and I, I'll just take a quick shot at that. Um, absolutely, it's possible that part of engagement planning and involving communities in development projects is um, including them as beneficiaries and partners in these projects. Um, and I think that what's critically important is not for a company or a government to sit behind closed doors and say, let's just build them a hospital or a soccer stadium and they'll be happy, which is is all too common, um, but to really engage with communities about what is their vision for development and um, you know, to, to have conversations so that a community is in agreement with the kinds of benefits that they want to see delivered from a development project. Thank you very much, Kate. Uh, thank you, Santiago, for your question. Um, Today we, we, we have learned about the stakeholder involvement in the case of Kenya. We encourage uh, our attendees to share their stories um, from, from their own countries, including challenges and successes of meaningful stakeholder involvement in decision-making uh, processes. We also have our second question of the day. Uh, it says, from the presentations, it is clear that stakeholder engagement throughout the mining cycle is perceived as crucial for the viability of mining. But do we invest enough in this field, both in terms of financial investments and capacity to implement? Well, I, I'll just I'll jump in there too, but I, I'd love to hear from Rose and Matt's on it. But my answer would be no, we do not. And I think we need a lot more investment in building the capacity of companies and communities and independent third parties to um, to really develop stronger stakeholder engagement, more durable. Um, yeah, so my answer is no. <laughs> but I'd love to hear from yeah. Matt's. Yeah, and and uh, I think my first uh, reaction to that question is, is is no as well. But it's a really good question, and it, it actually highlights the the what we are talking about now. We have so many things in place, but as you said, Kate, there are uh, from the example in Canada, the 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 number of good examples are are very limited. So so. This is an issue that is growing in importance, and we sort of understand the importance, uh, but still, apparently, there is a gap. And I guess part of that problem is is uh, investments and 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 capacity in people doing these uh, assessments and strategies and and the implementation. So no, I don't think we invest enough. Yeah, and I think I would add that there are a lot of good people out there who understand um, meaningful engagement and who are trained as dialogue facilitators and there are more and more studying it and learning it and I think it's 
um, it's important that people tap that, um, the companies and governments um, tap that resource. Um, I know that there are a lot of people who train as mediators and facilitators who don't want to work for a company because they think that's kind of going to the dark side. But I do think that those companies internally need those core competencies um, and that, that shouldn't be ruled out for people who have an interest in this field um, because from the inside, they can make a big difference in, in creating better engagement strategies. Um, so that's just, uh, I think that something that shouldn't be ruled out for people who want to become neutral facilitators. <laughs> the other issue is that a company will often hire somebody, a third party, that then is not seen as legitimate by the opposing side or by a community because they're taking money from the company. And so it's important for the third parties to establish trust from both sides because it's often the company that can afford to do it um, and that communities need to be willing to listen to people who have that cap capacity and, and truly are neutrals even if they have to take a paycheck from the company. Maybe I can just add, I think there are two issues uh, here in terms of uh, investment. Please, Rose. Important. Hello, um, I'm saying that uh, there are two issues uh, with regard to uh, whether there is enough investment that is uh, being done for stakeholder engagement. And uh, as Man said, no. And uh, there are also two issues, one relating to capacity building for particularly for communities to engage. And there is a really need uh, for the capacity of communities to be built in terms of understanding uh, these complex projects so that they can uh, be able to participate from an informed uh, perspective. And this can be done usually by trusted, uh, perhaps uh, civil society organizations and non-governmental organizations. And also there's hardly enough funding uh, and money going uh, to, these, uh, to these issues. Uh, secondly, is uh, internally within um, different uh, companies. And uh, in addition to just uh, setting aside perhaps a, a, jet, a budget and personnel to do this is really the important uh, issue of integrating uh, this uh, aspect of stakeholder engagement in the different uh, processes so that, uh, yes, as much as you have dedicated people who uh, carry out these functions, but uh, other people within the company should be able to also uh, understand and, uh, and also engage our stakeholders uh, appropriately. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, June Prester has a question. June, the floor is yours. Oh, hi. Um, I work in restoration and reclamation, and I wondered, um, is the community involved in this, in these negotiations, um, to, to speak about their prior knowledge of these areas? Uh, so that they can inform those reclamation or restoration processes and then during the project and perhaps post the project are the communities involved in restoring the lands and monitoring them over time so that the the reclamation project can, the project can take some form of the lands being restored to what they're familiar with like there's maybe medicinal plants or just a larger landscape in general. Thank you, June. Let's hear our, our experts. Yeah, in, in my experience where um, there, I have been associated with projects where there are entire stakeholder engagement plans just around restoration, I, I think it needs to happen more often, but certainly that should be part of a, a stakeholder engagement plan. Um, as, as Mats and Rose both mentioned, the project life cycle, that part of the project life cycle is how do you shut it down and clean it up? And it's critically important. And local knowledge, I really don't think, you know, a, a um, project can be done adequately without the local knowledge. Um, there's a uranium mine in um, 
the northwestern part of the United States that's there's a cleanup project going and it's on the indigenous lands of um, a group from Washington State and they've been very much involved in what that cleanup and restoration should look like. Uh, it's been a very contentious project because a lot of the, the company and the environmental regulator have been in conflict about how to engage the community but they've spent several years um, trying to work it out and uh, made some progress so they are very much involved and you mentioned monitoring one of the the ways that um, you can often get to yes when you're trying to help stakeholders work out conflicts or when you're just trying to um, put together a meaningful stakeholder plan is to involve the community in every step of the monitoring and build capacity in communities for water quality monitoring or air quality monitoring and help build trust in the science and build some capacity in the science so that um, so that they can be engaged in that aspect of, of a project as well. Thank you very much, uh, yeah. Kate and Jin. Um, we are. Can I just add uh, this? Oh, sorry. No, go, go ahead, uh, Matt. No, no, no. I just uh, so I, I don't have a clear answer uh, myself, but we we discussed this uh, even last week in in, in Colombia uh, about the need for 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 thinking about closure and post closure early in the process and ensure that there are I mean considering that the life cycle of a mine can be many 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 years that it's important to, to, to of course um, uh, monitor the, the the current status but also ensure that there are funds or, or bonds or money to, to remediate and, and to restore so, so I mean it's a very good question and it's it's necessary to, to plan this early in the, in, in the mining cycle Thank you. We are running out of time. We have time for two more questions. I will pass the word to Kirti Kiap, who raised his hand. And we also have a question from Friday, which is uh, Kirti, the microphone is yours. Kirti, are you still there? Okay, uh, from, from Friday, um, Friday asks, how do you handle stakeholders on agreeable divergent view du during engagement to knowing what they really want? Well, that's, that's such an excellent question um, because sometimes I think communities are seen as homogenous, that they must just want something, and that's not the reality at all. Um, and in a lot of the work, at least that I do, we spend a lot of time working with communities, the individual interest groups, so a group of um, community members who have to work together to agree on what it is they want, to identify it and, and come to some agreement before they can even sort of go to the table or work together productively with the company. Um, Rose, you mentioned earlier um, the importance of building capacity in communities. We have a colleague, um, Antonio Bernales in um, Peru, who talks a lot about um, building capacity in communities for them to come up with their own vision. A company or a government comes in and says, here's, here's our plan, it's in these hundreds of pages, here are our lawyers, here's what we're going to do. But communities don't have that same um, plan. And so the idea of um, communities really sitting down and figuring out what is our vision for development and how does this project fit in with that, um, I think is a, a great idea if it's radical or difficult maybe but I think um, very important and really putting some energy and investment into helping communities come up with their own vision in, in a consensus based process. Thank you very much Kate. Um, our next question is from um, Kirti Kiap. Kirti asks what do you think is the best way to have stakeholder engagement when some state-owned um, campaigns uh, 
or do not want to engage community at all? Sorry, I'll read the question again. What do you think it, it's the best way to have stakeholder engagement when so some state-owned companies do not want to engage communities at all? That's, that's another great question because that's very, very common. Um, just a story from Suriname where um, it was that not actually a state-owned company, but a private company operating in Suriname, and Suriname is a signatory to um, the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, and Newmont Mining Company was operating a mine, is still, um, on the traditional lands of the Pamaka people. And the company said to the government, we have to engage these stakeholders. And the government said, no, you don't. We told you to go and develop that deposit. Why are you talking to these guys? Just go do it. And Newmont was felt in a little bit of a conflict then with the government because they said, we have this obligation because of the standards that we have to follow. And um, so we have to do it anyway. And so the negotiation became between the company and the government. Um, that basically the company ended up having to say, we won't develop it if we can't engage with these people. Um, and state-owned companies are even more of a challenge, I would say. So it's a very great question. Um, and I think that the, they face a lot of risk and increasing risk as more and more communities understand their rights and as they organize more clearly on exercising those rights. Thank That's you, very much. Please. Daniel, if you please, allow please. me to come in. Of course, go ahead. Uh, in, okay, thank you. Uh, in the cases of uh, state-owned uh, enterprises, um, I would uh, refer to the, uh, the UN guiding principles on uh, business and human rights. And uh, principle four actually uh, addresses uh, the state uh, business nexus and uh, essentially is that uh, state-owned companies really have uh, the they have the same uh, responsibilities as uh, private uh, companies but indeed they actually have uh, greater responsibilities uh, because um, they are really uh, owned uh, and, uh, and, uh, and controlled uh, by, by the state. So essentially, uh, when they fall short, then it is actually the state itself that is uh, falling short of, uh, of its obligations. But uh, generally, they are held to the same standards as, uh, as any other uh, private uh, company. Thank you. Thank you, Rose, and thank you, Friday, for your question. Um, our last question comes from Stanley in D4. Um, Stanley asks, some of these mines are located in protected, protected areas or potential protect, protected areas, like national parks. What measures can be put in place for an intersector, intersectorial stakeholder engagement with the indigenous people? Do you want to tackle that one, Matt? <laughs> yes, is Matt or Rose, any of you would like to yeah, Rose. contribute to this question? Sorry, so the question how to, to, to have a, a cross-sectoral approach and also involving indigenous people. That is correct, Matt. Uh, okay, and I actually I don't have, a, have a, an answer uh, like that other than I, that I can agree that it's a really good question and it, again relating to our experience in the environmental governance program and also sort of highlighting the importance of, of looking at stakeholders as stakeholders so so not only uh, affected communities but also because I'm uh, sorry because we see that uh, coordination between uh, different government levels between different uh, agencies is all often highlighted as a problem uh, be, be, yeah the, the the coordination between the stakeholders is 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 not that good and this leads to to, to uncoordinated uh, efforts sometimes in in 
especially when it comes to, to, to involving indigenous people. And you have different approaches, you have different views on, on, on legislations that apply, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I just wanted to highlight the, the importance of, of coordination between government institutions and, and agencies as well, to, to find a, a, a common ground sort of to, to, to address the, these issues. I don't know if you, if somebody can come up with a more concrete answer, but I think that's an, uh, an important, a very important uh, aspect. It, that it's a great point, Mats, and um, and Rose might have some more direct insight on this. Um, I do think that any company that's going to develop on public lands, national parks, protected areas, um, has extra um, sort of obligation and requirement to protect those lands. Um, protecting those kinds of lands are also included in a lot of the national standards, international norms and standards and safeguards, and particularly when indigenous people are impacted. Um, and so those are, um, you know, basically extra risks and most, most Nash, uh, international companies or companies that are developing in those areas will be well aware of the those obligations as they relate to the, those kinds of lands and stakeholder groups. Um, Rose, maybe you have some additional insight. Um, I could just add that uh, with regards to indigenous people, the question of, uh, as Kate mentioned, the uh, ethic uh, or pre-prior informed uh, consent is, uh, is quite uh, important. And uh, this also means that um, uh, perhaps uh, for projects that uh, are on lands that are owned by indigenous people, uh, you one might need to consider actually um, uh, flexibility in terms of uh, the time it takes to to engage. And uh, this is because uh, there's really uh, a lot of uh, stress on uh, respecting uh, the rights of indigenous people to uh, also have uh, space to be able to discuss uh, issues amongst themselves and uh, actually uh, and you'll come up with a, a common uh, a common standing on the question of representation on um, on um, interagency or interministerial um, platforms again with regard to indigenous uh, persons uh, it will be important to ensure that uh, whoever represents them on such uh, platforms is, uh, 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 is someone or a representative uh, who the indigenous uh, people have uh, selected uh, themselves. So um, unlike what we normally see uh, in government or interministerial or forums where it's usually a, a function that is uh, selected to represent, uh, in this case, uh, would have to really defer to the indigenous people themselves to choose uh, their own uh, representation. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone, for your questions. Thank you, our experts, for your great answers. We have three more minutes before this uh, session ends. I'm going to pass the word to our colleague Eva for closing remarks. Thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you very much, everyone, for this enriching discussion. Before I close uh, the, the webinar with a couple of uh, pieces of information uh, for next year, Matt, do you have any brief concluding remarks, uh, two minutes, just to conclude the webinar and the main findings, the main lessons or, or next steps, at least on this learning on environmental governance? Yes, I will try my best. Uh, very brief. Uh, I, think, I think we can conclude that, that the, I mean, it, it's a very important issue, this. It is complex. There are no easy answers, uh, but in a way, I think, uh, and this may sound a little bit naive, but but it's it, to me, it's it, it's a mindset. So so for stakeholders, for governments, for the private sector, and also for communities and other concerned stakeholders. So apart from fulfilling our obligations, because there are obligations. It also, as, as, as Rose mentioned, there are opportunities and possibilities, both in fulfilling human rights, rule of law, good governance, but also contribute to, to uh, ecological sustainable development. I mean, to, to prevent the environment from, from degrading. So there are 
it's about a mindset. It's it's about finding uh, common solutions to, to to common problems. I guess we have a long way to go, but there are many many good examples or or, or many good. Um, we have a framework, so we need to to continue to 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 work with that framework, according to me, uh, uh, and keep um, the, the, trying to improve the situation, both in terms of human rights and you know, working with the environmental issues. Because mining done right is, is, is something that we that we need. Uh, I think we can agree on that, even though we haven't said it that much. But but mining done right, it, it's something that we all can benefit from. So that is basically. Uh, what I got from from this um, webinar, and hopefully we can uh, we can have some more. I think we need to discuss this more. <laughs> well, actually, that's a perfect segue, Matt, uh, because um, this is the last webinar for the 2017 uh, series on environmental governance. But we will be back in 2018 with the second part of the monitoring webinar series, focused on environmental monitoring, participatory environmental committees. So the webinar in English be, will be on January 24th, and the webinar in Spanish will be January 25th. So more information to follow, but please stay tuned. And then on behalf of the MBSA Forum and the GOXI Learning Series, as well as UNDP and the Swedish Environmental Protection Agency, I would like to thank all of our attendees of the Environmental Governance and Mining Webinar Series, at least for 2017. As you know, the MBSA Forum is a global partnership to support development and implementation of effective national biodiversity strategies and action plans, the MBSAPs, and it's hosted by the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity, the United Nations Development Program, and the UN Environment Program. Now, GOXI is a standing online forum for innovation and collaboration across stakeholder groups, countries, and initiatives that aims to strengthen governance of the extractive sectors. So we encourage you to visit both the GOXI and the MBSAF forum online platforms and join them. Uh, after today's webinar, I would like to invite you all to fill out the feedback survey that you will receive via email. Your feedback is valuable for us to improve our e-learning efforts. And again, I invite you all to check out the MBSAF forum net. Um, website where we will continue this conversation. If you have any unanswered questions, we're happy to post them there and speak to the presenters so they can in turn respond to your questions. We will post the, the recording of today's webinar as well as the presentations. We also have all our videos on our YouTube channel, so the MBSAF Forum YouTube channel. So again, please stay tuned for our next sessions in 2018. We will have a fantastic webinar series in 2018. And of course, you can always follow us on the MBSAP Forum, Facebook, and Twitter. And lastly, again, I'm Eva Gurria from the MBSAP Forum. Hope you all enjoyed the session and hope you have a great rest of your day, your evening. Goodbye, and thank you all for attending this webinar today. And thank you, Matt, and presenters for an amazing and enriching discussion.